There are women whose fertility challenges arise from medical conditions entirely outside their control, though even they may recognize pieces of this story. This story doesn't deny their reality, because some of what erodes our fertility is not what happens in the body, but what happens to our relationship with it. From the earliest years, a young girl is taught, often indirectly, that to be valuable is to be logical, composed, and externally approved of. She's encouraged to suppress signals that emerge from her body, discomfort, instinct, uncertainty, and to instead perfect the appearance of control. Over time, this conditioning becomes so familiar, she stops noticing the divide growing within her, a split between her inner rhythm and the outer structure she's constantly adapting herself to. School reinforces this divide with precision. The curriculum rewards correctness over curiosity, performance over presence. When she feels deeply, she's told to control herself. When she questions from instinct, she's asked for evidence. By the time she enters higher education, she has been expertly trained in the art of external reference, learning to trust footnotes and frameworks long before she ever learns to recognize the quiet authority of her own physiological knowing. Eventually, logic no longer serves as a tool. It becomes her identity. She becomes logic. She is the informed woman, the rational woman, the one who does her research and anticipates outcomes. She feels uneasy when intuition speaks, unless she can back it up with a study. A feeling isn't enough anymore, not unless it's footnoted, not unless she can explain it away. She now internalizes this identity. So when the institutions she trusts begin to speak, not with malice, but with data, with projections, with probability, she listens without hesitation. Fertility drops rapidly after 35. They say, you should consider freezing your eggs. They suggest, time may already be working against you. They declare, none of this sounds coercive. It sounds like foresight, like wisdom, but beneath that wisdom is a quiet fear. And beneath that fear, a deeper disconnection from the body itself. She acts with measured rationale. She consults specialists, runs blood panels, tracks hormone levels, prepares for contingencies that haven't yet arrived. She calls it planning, and on the surface it is. But beneath the surface, what drives it is less the presence of danger and more the absence of trust. Even if she's never once tried to conceive, she already carries the belief that her body may not be able to do it. By her early 30s, this internalized doubt has grown so familiar, she mistakes it for reality. Even when her cycle is regular, even when her health is intact, she finds herself rehearsing language that anticipates failure. If I'm still fertile, if I didn't wait too long, if my body can still do this. Without ever declaring it, she begins to treat her own biology as a question mark, a variable she no longer feels entitled to trust. Eventually, language steps in to finish what culture began. At 35, she is classified as advanced maternal age. If she becomes pregnant, it's a geriatric pregnancy. And if it's her first, she is labeled an elderly primigra vida. These are not just medical terms. They are thresholds, ones that recast the woman who was once told to wait as now being late possibly too late. Even if she feels strong, even if nothing in her body suggests fragility, the shift in language alters how others see her and, more dangerously, how she begins to see herself. Alongside this language, an entire infrastructure rises to meet the doubt it helped create. Egg freezing becomes a corporate benefit. Fertility preservation is marketed as empowerment. Insurance covers early intervention. Clinics offer incentives for proactive action. To her, these seem like progress, modern solutions to modern problems. But beneath the convenience lies a signal that her biology is no longer trustworthy, that her body's timing must be managed like a portfolio. She may be offered coverage to freeze her eggs, but not for rest or therapy or a sabbatical. 
The system will subsidize her doubt, but not her restoration. What goes unspoken is the cost of the years that led to this moment, the lifestyle that was once encouraged, late nights, stimulant cycles, numbing habits, hormonal suppression, constant performance placed cumulative strain on the body. She is now told has simply aged out. And yet, when difficulty arises, the finger doesn't point to cultural neglect, systemic pressure, or physiological wear. It points only to the number on her chart, her age, as if time were the root of the issue and not the conditions under which it passed. Years later, she may return to the eggs she froze in her 20s, expecting them to deliver certainty, or at least peace of mind. But what she finds is something more complicated. The body she now lives in is no longer the one those eggs were harvested from years earlier. Her hormonal terrain has shifted. Her nervous system is different. Her internal chemistry has evolved with the shape of her life. And although the eggs remain viable, they no longer belong to a system in sync with their original context. Because the body is not a fixed structure, but dynamic and, more importantly, adaptive. And as such, no part can move in isolation without affecting the whole. And yet, quietly, science is beginning to whisper a different possibility. In recent years, researchers have found stem cells in the ovaries, Cells that may hold the potential to generate new eggs, even after the so-called biological clock, has begun its countdown. The research is early, and the implications still unfolding. But the suggestion alone reshapes the story. That the female body is not simply in decline, it is alive, adaptive, and more regenerative than we've been taught to believe. Not a ticking clock, but a responsive field. Changing, yes but not passively fading. By her late 30s or early 40s, a new term enters the conversation, perimenopause. It may be introduced casually or through subtle clinical suggestion, but its presence begins to cast a long shadow over her experience. Even if her body is strong, her cycle regular, her energy vibrant, she begins to monitor for signs of decline, to interpret fluctuations as evidence of deterioration to prepare for a version of herself that she has not yet met, but already feels expected to become. She is being set up. What makes all of this so potent is not any single message, but the feedback loop that underlies how she now lives. Her beliefs shape what she notices. What she notices influences her biology. Her biology informs how she feels, and how she feels confirms what she believes. She feels a cramp and remembers the phrase, geriatric pregnancy. Her heart rate rises. She goes online. The stress alters her hormones. The tension confirms, maybe I waited too long. This loop does not need to be enforced. It only needs to go unexamined. And over time, it creates a reality that feels less like conditioning and more like truth. But there is another path. Not through force, not through affirmation, but through quiet clarity. She doesn't need to lie to herself with positive conditioning. She doesn't need to overwrite fear with false hope. She simply needs to see, without distortion, that her body was never the enemy. It was simply responding to years of learned tension, imposed expectation and chronic neglect. And just as the body learned to adapt to pressure, it can learn to return to balance if given the right environment. That environment doesn't require optimization. It asks for restoration, more sleep, nourishing food, stillness, movement, sunlight, less noise, more breath, and most of all, a willingness to stop managing the body like a machine and instead relate to it as something alive, responsive, and whole because it is. Even science is beginning to remember this, that within a woman's body are not just remnants of fertility, but quiet reserves of potential. Stem cells in the ovaries, still waiting to be understood. Not proof, not promise, but strong possibility. A reminder that this body, so often treated as a problem to solve, 
is still adapting, still listening, still capable of surprising her. The loop can be thrown out. The rhythm can be restored. And the woman she was always meant to be can meet the body that is still capable of carrying her the way it was always meant to. No one else needs to say yes. Her body already has.